Three centuries ago, the most versatile and most important of all keyboard instruments, the piano, was invented. It was named by its creator a cembalo che fa il piano e il forte, a harpsichord which can produce piano and forte sounds and naturally all the other dynamic shadings too, just as a human voice or a violin player can do. This remarkable achievement was the culmination of numerous and strenuous efforts by many craftsmen ever since the 15th century. Shortly before 1700, it took the genius of Bartolomeo Cristofori and the sponsoring Medici family of Florence to launch such an innovation. And since then, the new instrument has literally conquered the world. The ancient city of Padua in northern Italy claims Cristofori as its native son. He was baptized at Padua's San Luca Church on May 4, 1655. The original spelling of his name seems to have been Cristofani or perhaps Cristofali. In Florence, it was changed to Cristofori. This talented inventor of the Hammer Flügel, to give the instrument its German name of Beethoven's time, apprenticed as a musical instrument maker in Padua, and very likely tried his hand at every kind of string instrument. But his special interests focused probably early in his career on improving the harpsichord. Cristofori must have thought for years about a solution of the old mechanical problem of how a cembalo could make subtle dynamic shadings. Prince Ferdinand de' Medici made the acquaintance of Cristofori at the latest in 1688. This highly musical prince of the distinguished ruling Florentine family had a reputation as a special patron of the arts. Having learned of Cristofori's efforts to improve the harpsichord, the prince invited him to join the Florentine court. Records from 1688 show that at the age of 33, Cristofori drew an income from the princely purse. His appointment as curator of all the musical instruments at the Medici court soon followed. Shortly before 1700, Cristofori successfully implanted a hammer mechanism into a cembalo corpus. When in 1700 Cristofori was requested to make a list of the musical instrument collection, he took this opportunity to describe his newly invented cembalo as a new harpsichord which may be played piano and forte. Un apicembalo di nuova invenzione che fa il piano e il forte. New York's Metropolitan Museum houses one of the most valuable collections of musical instruments anywhere. In its keyboard instrument section, the pride of place goes to Cristofori's Cembalo con Martellini from 1720, the world's oldest known piano. Credit for its excellent restoration is due to the museum's master restorer, Stuart Pollins, whose painstaking efforts made the instrument playable again. The Cristofori piano at the Metropolitan Museum is at present the only one of the three extant pianos by this Florentine builder which is in a playable condition. Prior to the invention of the piano, just before the year 1700, the only keyboard instrument which was capable of dynamic nuance was the clavichord. The clavichord used a small blade of metal attached to the end of the key. And when the key was pressed, the tangent would come up and, stri and just touch the string. Um, because it touched the string and maintained contact with the string during the sound, the string was not really free to vibrate. Christofori's invention of the hammer mechanism provided a hammer which delivered a pulse of, uh, of energy to the string, and consequently, a greater volume of sound was created. The secret of this mechanism was the little escapement lever operated by a spring, which enabled the hammer to fall immediately after impact. The clavichord produced a very small sound, and I'll demonstrate it now. Christopher's piano cre created a much greater volume of sound. 
To celebrate the recent centennial of the collection of musical instruments, the Metropolitan Museum invited the pianist Paul Badura Skoda to give a concert for the Friends of the Museum using the Cristofori piano restored for this occasion. You just have heard the world's oldest preserved piano, a Hammerflügel made by Christophery in 1720, exhibited today in the Metropolitan Museum. If it does look to you like a harpsichord, that it is because it is a harpsichord as far as appearance goes. Inside there is a hammer action which makes it a cembalo con martellini or a cembalo senza penne, a harpsichord with small hammers and without quills, hammers which touch the strings instead of plucking them. Such wing-shaped instruments in German flügel mit und ohne kiele or hammerflügel or kielflügel were being offered for sale in the local Viennese newspaper, the Wienerische Diarium of December 1725. The announcement read, It is here withdrawn to the notice of those who love beautiful and well-made keyboard instruments that the famous organ builder Johann Christoph Leo of Augsburg has arrived in Vienna with various pieces from his workshop of recent and excellent invention, including true lutes, harps, harpsichords with and without quills, along with other wing-shaped instruments which he has brought with him so that they can be tried out. In his advertisement, Leo thus offered not only normal harpsichords with quills, but also hammer harpsichords. Probably the most admired keyboard player of Cristofori's time was Domenico Scarlatti. When in 1702, Domenico, as a 17-year-old lad, while visiting Florence with his father, first encountered the new harpsichord with hammers, he must have been impressed and delighted to discover the possibilities this new instrument opens for a performer. Trying to trace the place where the workshop of Cristofori in Florence was, 
we may guess that it was in the Uffizi. From there, he could bring his precious instruments safely over the Ponte Vecchio Bridge to the Palazzo Pitti, in case a concert was scheduled to take place there. In and outside Tuscany, Bartolomeo Cristofori had become known for his new Hammerflügel. One of his customers in 1706 was Cardinal Ottoboni in Rome, to whom he delivered a hammer harpsichord. The young Handel probably had to play this cembalo con Martellini during the famous contest with Domenico Scalati in Ottoboni's palace in 1709, and Domenico was probably more familiar with it than Handel, and thus won. As with most innovation, Christophery had students and imitators. Take, for example, Domenico del Mela, who had managed to build a vertical hammerflügel in 1739, which today belongs to the Florence Conservatory and is exhibited in the Palazzo Vecchio. Christophery's most famous pupil was Giovanni Ferrini, who inherited his workshop. He built himself hammer harpsichords and at least once also a compound instrument, a combination of a hammerflügel with a harpsichord. It has a two-manual keyboard. The lower keyboard activates the harpsichord with quills and the sound is brilliant. The upper keyboard is connected with the hammer mechanism. Thus the instrument is combining what were essentially two different instruments. The tiny hammers of hollow curved parchment can be played only on a softer dynamic level, but with more subtle expressive shadings. This compound harpsichord allowed a sound experience which was certainly a revelation for musicians, who now quickly could switch from brilliant passages or imitated tutis demanding a forte sound to soft, delicate, cantabile sections. Ludovico Giustini wrote six sonate, which are the first known piano sonatas written expressively for the piano. Sonate da cimbalo di piano e forte, detto volgarmente di Martelletti. It is no mere coincidence that these sonate were dedicated to Scarlatti's royal pupil, Don Antonio, in Lisbon. Scarlatti's other distinguished pupil there, the Portuguese princess Maria Barbara, who later became the Queen of Spain, took Scarlatti with her to Seville and Madrid, and purchased, during her lifetime, at least five hammer harpsichords. 
When tracing the development of the Hammer Klavier in the German-speaking countries, we do find ample evidence of early attempts at building keyboard instruments capable of dynamic shades. Wir befinden uns hier in Nürnberg im Germanischen Nationalmuseum. Here at the German National Museum in Nürnberg, we encounter the world's largest collection of keyboard instruments, including nearly 400 pianos. The museum was enriched through the merger of the two vast collections from the collectors Rück and Neupert. It also owns the oldest dated German square piano, built 1742 by a virtually unknown artisan called Socher from Sonthofen, a little town near the Tyrolean border. During the Baroque period, practically all keyboard instruments with strings were built in Germany by organ builders, who proudly called themselves organ and instrument makers. Sebastian Bach's friend, Gottfried Silbermann, signed his instruments with this title. Later also, Johann Andreas Stein. Born in Saxony in 1683, Gottfried Silbermann learned his craft from his older brother Andreas in Strasbourg in Alsace. He returned to his native Saxony to open his own workshop in Freiburg in 1711. While still in Strasbourg, Silbermann had built in 1704 for the dulcimer virtuoso Pantalone Hebenstreit a rather large instrument distinguished from all other dulcimers by its size and double stringing with gut and metal strings. Listen to the sound of a normal sized dulcimer. Silbermann's dulcimer for Hebenstreit was a much larger instrument. With his certainly unique virtuoso technique, Hebenstreit had then tremendous success when concertizing before King Louis XIV at Paris, who afterwards gave the large instrument its name, Pantalone, the Christian name of its owner. With this instrument, Hebenstreit traveled through Europe, concertizing everywhere, until he found a well-paid employment at the court in Dresden. Hebenstreit's dulcimer was as large as a harpsichord. No one could play it with sticks as impressively as Hebenstreit himself. To facilitate playing, probably Gottfried Silbermann invented a keyboard connected with a hammer action to be placed on top of the pantalone corpus. Similar instruments were then built in many small towns in Saxony around 1720 and called pantalone. They were the primitive forerunners of the piano, had metal strings and no dampers, and thus an intermingling of sounds. We have heard the instrument with metal strings, but now we have stringed it with gut strings, and this sounds now quite differently, doesn't it? <laughs>
Christofori's instruments had dampers, but no mechanism to lift the dampers. Such a device was a German innovation, inserted by Silbermann into his early Hammerflügel and found long after in square pianos. In Nuremberg is a Hammerflügel of Gottfried Silbermann. The Silbermann Flügel in the museum in Berlin, however, was made by his nephew Heinrich. Gottfried Zilbermann's Hammerflügel had a very similar action to Christofori's, but the additional device for lifting the dampers. In 1732, Zilbermann presented such a grand piano to the Elector of Saxony, August III. Apparently, he also brought one of these new instruments to Leipzig and named it Piano Fort, a fact which was mentioned in Volume 5 of Zedler's Universal Lexicon, issued in 1733 thus being the first instance of the use of Christofori's adjectives, piano e forte, as a noun. Regrettably, Bach scholars failed for decades to understand the meaning of an advertisement that Bach placed in a Leipzig newspaper in 1733. Leipzig, June 16th, 1733. Tomorrow there will be in the Zimmermann Gardens a concert of the Collegium Musicum, whereby local audiences will hear a brand new instrument, a clavicimbalum played here for the very first time. Not only in Italy, also in Germany and France, the term cembalo, cimbalo, or clavecin, respectively, was in common usage well into the 19th century and still applied to the Hammerflügel. When using the Italian language, even such composers as Mozart or Beethoven used the term cembalo in their manuscripts when actually referring to the piano. Sometimes both terms were linked together. According to Forkel, Frederick the Great amassed no fewer than 15 Hammerflügel from Zilbermann. When J.S. Bach visited Frederick the Great's court in Potsdam in 1747, the king played a theme and requested from Bach elaborations on it. Bach improvised the composition later entitled Musikalisches Opfer. Reporting on Bach's visit to the Prussian king, the Berlin newspaper made it clear that Frederick, as well as Bach, used a pianoforte when playing at this occasion. Bach's son, Carl Philipp Emanuel, was in the employ of Frederick the Great, as was Kvantz, the king's flute teacher. Both musicians already used the term pianoforte in their treatises, but elsewhere this term was still little or not at all known. Only in London, where German musical instrument makers emigrated from war-stricken Saxony in the 1750s and 1760s, the term pianoforte came slowly into use. Sebastian Bach's youngest son, Johann Christian Bach, played the piano privately in 1763 and publicly from 1767 onwards. After 1760, music played on pianos was certainly more often heard than hitherto believed. In Vienna's imperial court archives, an entry can be found from 1763, confirming officially that public concerts on a 40 piano took place in March and in May at Vienna's Burgtheater. Thus, contrary to common belief, the first documented public concerts on pianos took place in Vienna and not in London. The third most important craftsman after Christofori and Zilbermann to play a role in the development of the piano was Johann Andreas Stein, Leo's successor in Augsburg. Born in 1728 in Swabia, he learned his craft as an organ and instrument builder mainly at the Zilbermann workshop in Strasbourg before starting his own business in Augsburg. Mozart admired Stein's Hammerflügel when he came to Augsburg in 1777 and wrote to his father in glowing terms a famous letter about these instruments. 
one can easily appreciate Mozart's enthusiasm when listening to a Stein forte piano. As you may have noticed, this Hammerflügel of Stein sounds almost like a modern piano. In the last quarter of the 18th century, the progress and in the development of the piano was constant and universal, with better and better examples being turned out by craftsmen, chiefly in Vienna, Paris, and London. On a larger scale, piano construction began only between 1770 and 1780, in Vienna by makers such as the brothers Wenzel and Johann Schanz, whose pianos Haydn liked best. In 1773, Haydn was seen by a visitor playing on a Hammerflügel, and it seems that the sonata in C minor, Hoboken 1620, cannot have been written for any other instrument but a Hammerflügel. Viennese craftsmen built instruments with an action, the so-called Viennese action, allowing for an especially subtle refinement. During the 1780s and 1790s, more than 50 workshops were already opened in Vienna, due to the fact that Emperor Joseph II abolished guild restrictions. By around 1800, there were more than 100 piano makers active in the imperial city. In Vienna in the 1780s, Anton Walter became the most successful builder. His pianos gave out voluminous sound. Mozart ordered one from him probably in 1782. It is the same instrument which is today exhibited in the house in Salzburg where Mozart was born. Mozart had been trained as an organist in Salzburg in his youth, and that is probably the reason why he ordered later in Vienna a second instrument from Walter, a forte piano pedale, which was placed underneath the Hammerflügel. In an announcement of one of his concerts, Mozart cited as a special attraction the use of this additional instrument, the Forte Piano Pedale. In the score of his piano concerto in D minor, Köchelverzeichnis 466, Mozart notated the following. All these notes can be played only on a piano combined with a pedal instrument. Unfortunately, Mozart's own pedal piano is lost and no original instrument from the 18th century is known to us, only some from the 19th century. A reconstruction of such a forte piano pedale you can see here, and you will hear now how the first solo of the D minor concerto sounds if played as written down by Mozart and how the pedal may enrich other compositions. Now I play the end of this passage the way it is usually done. And now the same with the pedal keyboard in the original notation.
But a trained organist can do much more with this pedal instrument, especially in free fantasies. Original master instruments of Mozart's time are seldom in such good condition that they can be played in concert. Their beautiful sound differs as much from replicas as modern violin differs in sound from a Stradivarius or a Guarnieri violin. In our studio, we have three original master instruments from the time of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. Please listen now to these three master instruments. First, to the shunts. And now the piano of Anton Walter. Now an instrument by John Broadwood from London, built in 1795. Now you will hear the three master instruments in Mozart's Piano Concerto for Three Pianos, K242 in F major. Christopher's pianos had dampers, but no device to lift the dampers. It fell to the talented Gottfried Silbermann to make the piano truly complete by adding such a device. Yet, even in Silbermann's pianos, the damper lifting mechanism was still activated by hand levers or stops, which limited naturally its use. First, you will hear the instrument here with hand levers as it sounds with dampers. The sound stops when the finger leaves the key. (laughs) 
Now listen to the first prelude of Bach's well-tempered clavier, first with tempers, that means dry, and then with the lifted tempers. The next step in the development of what is now called the pedal of the piano was the knee lever. Here one can play already Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata with changes of the pedal as we would say today. Pianos were built already from the 1790s on with pedals instead of knee levers, which soon was imitated on the continent. The Viennese piano makers liked to provide their instruments with different stops for sound colours, and many instruments were built with a number of pedals. Indeed, the pedal is one of the great inventions. It was in Vienna that uh, gradually the number of pedals uh, was increased and uh, that new tone colours were added. This one piano by Haschka, built at around 1820, has no less than six pedals, uh, very appropriate for people with six feet. And we shall now demonstrate what these pedals can do. First of all, there is a normal forte pedal. Then, like on every modern piano, there is a shifting pedal which uh, renders the sound more delicate. But people who practice at night or who accompany singers want even a more soft, a softer approach. And therefore, we have the moderator pedal, the felt strip, which uh, reduces the overtones and gives a very beautiful sound close to the modern piano. There is even a more soft pedal.
pedal, excuse my bad English. This is when you want to play after midnight, which makes the sound as soft as butter. I don't know whether our recording will render this well. Let's try. But not every pedal is to make the sound softer. There we have uh, the bassoon stop, a piece of parchment over the string, which produces a very particular effect. Let's see. But uh, the most popular of them all was the percussion pedal or the Turkish stop, which we could use, for example, in Mozart's Turkish march. But not every piano had six pedals. Uh, the piano contemporary to this of Konrad Graf had only four pedals. Let's see. On this instrument from Broadwood, built in 1817, you see only two pedals, like on modern pianos. However, there is a special feature which unfortunately is lacking today on our modern pianos. The right pedal is split in the middle, which means that the device to lift the dampers can be activated for the discant and the bass register separately. This makes it possible for the pianist to play easily the left hand staccato and the right hand legato or vice versa. Around 1800, Beethoven was the city's musical genius in residence, while Anton Walter produced the most expensive pianos. Not only Mozart, also Beethoven preferred for his concerts forte pianos made by Walter. To Beethoven's dismay, Walter wouldn't give him a piano free of charge as all the other piano builders had offered to do. Here we have two of the most beautiful five octave pianos in the world, a piano of Johann Schanz, a piano of Anton Walter, two of the most famous, perhaps the most famous, out of the around 100 important builders in Vienna around the turn of the century. Um, there's a letter from Haydn to a dedicatee of one of his sonatas saying, don't buy a Walter. Schanz is much better for your delicate hand. On the other hand, Mozart's instrument was a Walter, and his son writes that he always took his own instrument along with him to play his concerts rather than use another. And there's a letter from Beethoven where he says, I would rather pay 30 ducats uh, to Walter than get another instrument for nothing. Here's the Schanz.
Vater. Why don't we play something together? Let's. Around 1820, pianos by Walter and Chance were already old-fashioned. By then, the most famous Viennese piano maker was Konrad Graf. The pianist Ignaz Moscheles, who was used to play Broadwood pianos, wanted to borrow Beethoven's piano when coming to Vienna, but found it in need of repair. Konrad Graf offered to repair the Broadwood if Moscheles would also play on one of his pianos. sound of an early 19th century Broadwood. And this is the sound of a Graf. the story of the confrontation of these two instruments. The pianist Moscheles in 1823 wanted to show the Viennese public the virtues and the beauties of these English pianos and got Beethoven to lend his own Broadwood and got Konrad Graf to set it in, put it in order and gave a concert on which the first half was played on the Graf and the second half on the Broadwood and apparently the Viennese public, they retained their allegiance to the Viennese instrument. Yes, but suppose the concert had been in London. Yes, it might have come, come out quite the other way. Well, let's uh, start something and play the same work on alternately on All right. both pianos and let's see what our audience will decide. Shall I start? You start. Okay. <laughs> Quite often during late summers, Beethoven went to Baden near Vienna to take the waters. In the summer of 1823, Beethoven went to Baden. He wanted a piano there in order to complete uh, the finale of his Ninth Symphony. Konrad Graf uh, offered and delivered him one of his best instruments. Upon Beethoven's request, a percussion stop was built in, which, according to witnesses, Beethoven used quite frequently. It might have sounded like this.
This piano sounds particularly beautiful in the soft cantabile pieces, like the slow movement of the Hammerklavier Sonata. Pianos from the workshop of Anton Walter and Konrad Graf also played a role in the life of Franz Schubert. As a child, Franz met Konrad Graf in the workshop of the latter because a cousin of Schubert's father worked there until 1810, and the young Franz visited him quite frequently. Apparently, he was allowed to play on one of the pianos during recreation times. In 1814, his father presented him with an old piano, five octaves only, probably from Graf's workshop. In later years, the painter-reader rented a square piano from Walter and Son, on which Schubert played frequently. This instrument has been preserved and is exhibited today in the musical instrument collection of Vienna's Kunsthistorische Museum. Reader's well-known watercolor painting of Schubert portrays the composer lounging in an armchair with his right arm dangling over the side of the chair. Understandably, a small tafel clavier did not always suffice for the interpretation of Schubert's larger works. One would definitely need a concert grand in order to do justice, for example, to such a large-scale work as the Wanderer fantasy of Schubert. Among the famous visiting pianists adored by the Viennese audience was Clara Schumann. Konrad Graf was so impressed by her art and her personality that he presented her with a concert grand as a wedding gift when she finally could marry Robert Schumann. This instrument later came into the possession of Brahms, who left it to the Gesellschaft der Musikfreunde in Vienna. Unfortunately, it is not playable anymore. Another fine concert grand by Michael Schweighofer, one of the most successful among the more than 200 piano makers working in Vienna around 1840, is in better condition. With this instrument, Schweighofer won a gold medal for excellent workmanship at the World Exhibition of 1845. The warm and romantic sound of a Schweighofer piano is ideally suited for romantic music.
new phenomenon named Frédéric Chopin made his indelible mark on the musical scene around the same time as Schumann. Having learned to play and to love the piano in Warsaw in his formative years, he composed later nearly exclusively for this instrument. In Poland, he probably used a piano with a Viennese action. When he gave his first concerts in Vienna in 1829, he had no difficulties playing a concert grand from Konrad Graf, whose fine qualities and tone he praised in a letter to his parents. In Paris, on the other hand, Chopin owned a Playel piano, which is now in the possession of the Chopin Institute in Warsaw. Another piano on which Chopin liked to play in Paris was made by Erard. At present, it's in the Germanisches Nationalmuseum in Nuremberg. The instrument used by Chopin at his last public concert was a Broadwood piano. Concert grands of Broadwood had gone through a considerable change since 1817 and were more romantic in song. Franz Liszt, without doubt, was the greatest genius among all pianists. As a child prodigy, he gave his first public recital at the age of nine in Bratislava, a Hungarian city at that time. Studying afterwards with Czerny in Vienna, he played one a year later before Beethoven. Brought to Paris by his ambitious father another year later, Liszt was launched on a stellar career as a piano virtuoso there, playing in all important salons. He mesmerized society women who literally threw themselves at his feet and paved his truly international career across Europe. His powerful playing style wrecked more than one of the delicate wooden pianos, causing the industry to come up with more durable materials for frames and strings. When Liszt gave a concert, he often had more than one piano placed on stage so that he could change the instrument when strings broke 
or the tuning did not hold. So piano companies came up with the innovation of iron bars, and later with the copies of the American invention of metal frames for the pianos. Listen now to one of Liszt's powerful compositions, the second Hungarian Rhapsody, played on a Berzendorfer from 1870, constructed only with iron bars, and not yet with a metal frame. Simultaneously with Liszt's appearances in Europe, in the New World, a pianist named Gottschalk, who had been trained in Paris, was giving concerts using a concert grand by the Chickering Company of Boston. The same instrument makers built a piano for Liszt, who apparently liked its qualities. This concert grand now stands in the Liszt Museum in Budapest. The year 1853 was especially notable in the history of the piano. In that year, Three companies on two continents entered the business of piano manufacturing, leading to international prominence for all three of them. It was Bechstein in Berlin, Blüthner in Leipzig, and Steinway in New York. In Europe, especially, Bechstein won the admiration of concert pianists. Originally living in Braunschweig, the family Steinweg arrived in New York in 1850 and began to work in American piano factories before starting their own business. In a surprisingly short time, New York's Steinway Company became world famous for its marvelous instruments. We are here in Steinway House in New York. Here is the original work bank brought from Germany to America by Heinrich Engelbert Steinweg, and here is the lathe he used to build his first piano in this country. We have today the great privilege and honor to be received by the great grandson of the founder of the Steinway Company, Mr. Henry Steinway. It is a great pleasure for us. Leider kann ich nicht alles auf Deutsch sagen, ich muss auf Englisch. Wir sind hier so lange Zeit. The Steinways arrived in 1850, and they, at that time, started to work for other manufacturers to learn American methods and study piano production. And in 1853, when they started, they made the improvements using the iron frame and the overstringing, along with several improvements of their own, which made a better square piano. The square piano, Tafelklavier, was the staple of commerce in the United States and remained the steady product of the use in the home long after it had fallen into disuse in Europe, up until the 1880s. And it was largely due to Steinways later on that improved uprights, which could stand the severe climatic conditions of the United States were made, which eventually replaced the square in the 1880s. Of course, all these improvements that Steinway made were uh, included in the grand piano and eventually became known as the Steinway system, and all pianos are made more or less on that method today. Around 1880, the Steinway Company sent Liszt a Steinway Concert Grand Piano as a present. Liszt thanked them and praised the instrument enthusiastically. 
The Metropolitan Museum owns a Steinway concert piano from about the same time. You will hear now an intermezzo by Johannes Brahms from his Opus 118 being played on it. The Iraq Company in Paris had always been among the most innovative piano builders. Here you see a double piano, similar to Stein's vis-à-vis -vis flügel of 1777. Towards the end of the 19th century, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. This made it possible to retain for posterity an improvisation on the piano that until then was mostly at the mercy of human memory, once played and heard. Another invention prior to that concerns the so-called player piano, an instrument which reproduced music with the help of a perforated paper roll and a pneumatic mechanism which later became an electric one. It soon became immensely popular in America. At one time, more of these automatic instruments were built there than traditional pianos. In Europe, the phonola made by Hupfeld in Dresden was invented. In these mechanical pianos, a player could override some of the built-in facilities at will, such as tempo and the dynamic level. And then the more refined Velte Klaviere came into use. No less a composer than Edvard Grieg played his lyrical butterfly suite, opus number four, on a perforated paper roll which is still in existence. Finally, electric machines were applied underneath the instruments by the American Ampico Company. Such devices allowed amateur players to alternate on a piano with an added Ampico apparatus at will between a normal instrument and a player piano. One of five Bersendorfer instruments with this Ampico machine is owned by a collector in Lower Austria. Now let us listen to a composition entitled Papillon, composed and played on a perforated roll by a well-known performer in his days, Moritz Rosenthal. During the 20th century, neither the outer appearance nor the mechanical devices of the piano underwent radical changes. What did change, though, was the size of concert halls and the general idea of the perfect piano sound. The overwhelming impact of microphones brought about a demand for sharper, brighter, and much louder sounds. Here are the highly polished black colossuses that came to dominate the concert stages of our world. An old Bösendorfer Imperial Grand Piano, built shortly after World War I, has thinner strings and softer felt covers on its hammerheads than its modern brother. Much softer sounds can be produced on it than on the Bösendorfers of today. Its velvet tones are ideal for music from Impressionists, such as Debussy or Ravel. Listen to the former's Claire de Lune or Moonlight composition.
A special innovation during the period of Expressionism with the aim of creating more overtones was the so-called aliquot flugel by Julius Blutner. Here the extra strings are not directly hit by the hammers but made to sound independently, enlarging the sound of the overtone row, so that a special lingering sound effect may be produced. It sounds, even without using the pedals, like this. To stay with Debussy's impression of Claire de Lune, or Moonlight piece, the listener will get the impression of a musical halo forming around the moon, thanks to the special lyrical timbre effects of the aliquot strings. The piano of Blutner can really be made to sing, which is the highest accolade that can be accorded to an instrument. These are the words Wilhelm Furtwängler wrote into the Blutner family's almanac. Around the turn of the century, successful piano companies used to erect their own concert halls. In Berlin and London, Karl Beckstein built such halls. The one in London is still used today under the name Wigmore Hall. And so are the Saal Pleyel and the Saal Gavo in Paris. The Bersendorfer Hall stood on Herrengasse in central Vienna and ranked for half a century as the most frequented concert hall for piano and chamber music recitals, while the owner, Ludwig Bersendorfer, became a well-known, popular figure in Vienna. The old concert grands of Debussy's time produced a magical sound which more beautifully depict the impression of a sunken church in Debussy's La Cathédrale Anglotie than the pianos of today. Vienna's Bersendorfer company was smaller than either Steinway or Beckstein. Ludwig Bersendorfer's life ambition was not to turn out the greatest number of instruments, but rather to produce the most beautiful sounding pianos. He tested personally every piano that left the factory. The degree of truly handmade quality and special sound and timbre control led to the reputation of Bersendorfer's concert grands as being the Rolls Royce among the pianos. Thank you. 
During the 1920s and the 1930s of our century, the piano reached the pinnacle of its popularity. As long as silent movie pictures were offered to the general public, piano players provided the background music as well as the sound to the movements. Afterwards, the piano began being gradually displaced by radio and recorded music, which eventually became the chief source of musical entertainment. In North America, the automatic player piano was to rob many pianists of their jobs as entertainers. In contrast, in Latin America, piano players grew into popular heroes, especially if they played in the style of local folk music. The piano was also of great importance in shaping jazz. It was, for example, closely connected at the turn of the century with the development of ragtime music. The combination of percussion instruments with pianos is not only characteristic of jazz. It also plays a prominent role in modern piano scores. For instance, in the sonata for two pianos and percussion by the Hungarian composer Béla Bartók. This piece, composed around 1930, is rightly famous for its intoxicating rhythm. innovations in piano building occurred once more in the 1930s. The so-called Yankel keyboard was a typical example of the lengths to which innovators went to improve the piano's versatility. Using more than one keyboard, the player could go beyond the range of sound afforded by only a single set of keys. Subsequent attempts to make the instrument popular resulted in making it an object of mockery. As for Arnold Schoenberg, who began writing 12-tone music after the turn of the century, a special piano with a chromatic keyboard was an essential piece of equipment. In 1935, Schoenberg emigrated to the USA and taught music in Los Angeles. There, John Cage became one of his pupils. These gadgets I'm holding in my hands normally would have nothing to do with a musical instrument. Some composers, however, require these screws and nails cork, plastic, or rubber items to be secured inside the piano to obtain the required strange sounds intended. These bits and pieces placed between the strings of a piano alter the sound often beyond recognition. John Cage and others wrote such compositions for prepared piano. Here the piano had been treated with nine screws, eight bolts, two nuts, and three rubber belts. Alas, those robust experimentations ultimately led to an artistic dead end. Then there were the avant-garde efforts called aleatoric and cluster music style. The latter produced dissonant sounds in clusters. Still another variation on the same abstract theme of merging piano and drum sounds was attempted in Europe. 
Sometimes the keyboard isn't used at all. One is advised to wear a protecting mask when commencing to play this piece, or one of the steel strings, which often snaps, could hurt the player in the face. spend more time dwelling into the merits of aleatoric cluster music or that of prepared pianos, as good and bad music can be made with every kind of means. Yet, for the lover of the piano, it does matter if the favorite instrument is brutalized or if it is made to sound ugly. Other innovations show how hectic the life of a pianist may be. There are numerous piano contests and piano festivals organized around the world, especially in the United States and France. Often these occasions allow pianists to compare instruments of better-known companies with those of Yamaha, Fazioli, Petrov, or Kawai. And how do the prospects look in the piano building industry? Well, we reckon that a new generation of instrument makers will come to the fore specializing in authentic period instruments in order to recapture the sounds of old times. There will always be room or occasion to introduce new ideas. Take, for example, the Bonn piano maker who built a truly new instrument set up in a vertical fashion and altogether seven yards high. one may guess that it won't become a mass product. A computer grand piano built by the Bösendorfer company, presumably every pianist has already heard of. Where does the difference between a normal Bösendorfer grand and this enhanced computer grand lie? There is a black cupboard down below the instrument containing some quite complex electronics, able to register every nuance of the pianist's playing. To activate it, the pianist does require the service of an assistant. Nice. And now the reproduction, and I am sure you will not notice any difference in sound. What is really exciting about the computerized piano is that one can also correct any mistakes. To demonstrate this, Paul Badoroskoda is going to strike a false note on purpose to illustrate how it can be corrected. What is more, with the help of the computer, one may accompany oneself on the instrument, in effect doubling the pair of hands one has been given. As a fitting finale to this presentation of the history of the piano, Paul Badura Skoda now will accompany himself in the military march in D major for four hands by Franz Schubert. First he played the two left hands and now is completing the piece by playing the music for the two right hands. Mm -hmm. 